Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, Data Governance for the Connected Enterprise. I would like to start by introducing you to today's speakers. We have Irene Polakoff. Irene is the CEO and co-founder at Top Quadrant. We also have Jack Stivak, and he is a sem semantic solutions architect at Top Quadrant. And in today's webinar, Jack will be introducing the capabilities needed for effective data governance. He will present a high-level overview of how top-grade enterprise data governance enables a comprehensive but incremental approach to collaborative data governance. He will highlight the suite of modular packages available within top grade EDG that can be combined to support your targeted scope of data governance. Irene will then demonstrate that EDG is a flexible and interoperable data governance solution. She will show how it can meet the needs of the enterprise by supporting not only the representation, but also the connection of all types of data governance assets. Before we get started today, I'd like to review a few logistical items. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along by using your GoToWebinar controls. To pose questions, please look on the right-hand side control panel. You should see a drop-down box for questions. If you click on the box, you should be able to post your question at any time during the presentation. We will address as many questions as time allows at the conclusion of today's webinar. We will also have a couple of polling questions after Irene's demo, and we'll be recording today's webinar, and we'll send a link to that recorded version. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jack to introduce Top Quadrant in today's webinar. All right. Um, thank you, Christy. Um, I guess maybe we should just dive right into today's program on data governance using Top Rate Edge. Uh, First, a few words about Top Quadrant. Um, we were founded in 2001, and we're an innovator in enterprise information management solutions. We believe that capturing the meaning of information, including many different aspects of it, is essential for data governance. In organizations of any size, governance will always require many tools, but it must be scalable and interconnected if it's going to be effective, and proprietary vendor-specific piecemeal approaches will not accomplish that. Instead, these multiple solutions actually create additional silos. Our passion is for delivering open standards-based tools for comprehensive data governance that creates connections across silos, and I hope you'll share some of our excitement for this new possibility. We work with a variety of enterprise clients across different industries, and recently the financial services sector has been a significant focus area for data governance and metadata management because of its complexity and compliance requirements. So why do we think data governance is so important in the first place? Information is more critical strategically than it's ever been before. And its volume, velocity, and variety make it exponentially more difficult to manage. Data governance is important because it addresses key business needs and drivers to meet this challenge. And you can see several of these here. There's a growing realization that data governance tools and automation are very important for effective data governance. As an example, a financial industry management survey in 2016 found that 50% of respondent firms are making investments greater than $12 million in IT solutions to improve data governance. Data governance today increasingly has to identify and track all types of data, information assets, and applications, but actionable understanding requires that we connect the business, the technical, and the operational metadata about these assets into a single data landscape. Well, what does this look like in practice? A financial industry customer of ours is using Edge to do just this. A consulting firm produced a spreadsheet inventory for them, cataloging actually thousands of applications and their dependencies. So as a starting point, this customer is importing these lineage records into top rate Edge. In Edge, they use conceptual models to connect the applications with the data sources they use and build a map of the information ecosystem. And it's exactly this map that helps them answer the question, where does this data originate? Good chance many of you may have similar situations and challenges. 
Well, the challenges that come with this scope are large. Governance activities like these and the sources needing governance are both diverse. And without governance systems and automation for connection, data is fragmented and integration is typically dependent on human oversight, which tends to be expensive, slow, and error prone. As a result, our motivation and our key design goal in developing top rate edge is to support the full diversity of these data governance needs. And how does edge help? Well, here's where we actually get excited. Simply, it helps with standards-based model-driven governance that's comprehensive, incremental, and flexible. What does it take to do this? Well, it's all about connecting the dots, as we mentioned, between the business, the operational, and the technical metadata. And these dots or individual assets or elements need to be connected. Semantic technologies are uniquely suited to this process. Semantic or meaning-based standards describe the connections that collectively capture the meaning of how information and operations are actually related in the enterprise. And Top Rate Edge's rich collection of pre-built models speed this effort, allowing existing assets, processes, policies, rules, all to be represented for description. So it's these information elements, data, data sources, policies, assets, have meaning precisely because they relate to each other and to what you're trying to accomplish. And semantic governance is about relationship. It excels because it standardizes the integration and the connectivity of data and metadata that define the modern enterprise infrastructure. Harmonizing these relationships across departmental and system boundaries allows all of this diversity to come together in support of a global view and access to actionable information. Top Rate Edge makes this meaning available and actionable by capturing the key relationships using open standards developed by the W3C, same organization responsible for HTML, XML, and actually the World Wide Web itself. And standardization ensures that both information and its meaning will be available across different endeavors, silos, and enterprises for understanding, consistency, reuse, and automation. Increasingly, companies are recognizing the importance of describing semantics using a standards-based approach as opposed to vendor-specific proprietary approaches which create additional silos, barriers to interoperability, and vendor lock-in. It's the standards that bring top age edge, the true interoperability needed to achieve the data governance goals that we saw earlier. So digging a little deeper, we've said that edge makes it possible for you to manage and govern a complete range of assets, but different organizations have different priorities and starting points. With edge, you can start incrementally for instance, with business glossaries or reference data or metadata and extend to govern other assets if and when you're ready to do so. Edge allows you to tailor your growth in this way with a selection of governance packages offering pre-built models and features for the specific assets and use cases you need. In today's demo, we'll show how top rate Edge meets critical business needs for meaningful data, for analytics and reporting, and for regulatory compliance. Irene will demonstrate how you can use these convenient pre-built models within Edge to represent assets and connect them as needed. And moreover, how you can do this in a web-based multi-user environment with intuitive change management workflows, audit tracking, and visualization. After the demo, We'll be returning to highlight just a few capabilities that we won't have time to show live. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Irene, for the demo. Uh, thank you, Jack. And let's see if you could make me a presenter. 
Yep, you should be able to take the screen now. All right, you should uh, now be seeing my screen uh, with Tabrite Edge you know, home page displayed. Um, so the interesting uh, things that you could see on the left are different categories of items you, your organization may want to govern. So there are things like business glossaries, requirements, you know, data assets, um, data types, technical assets which you know, combine um, things like application processes, um, you know, the ETL scripts and um, even servers and infrastructure. Governance assets that may be about your policies, um, your reports, your forms, and uh, assets of that nature. There are quite a number of things that you could see on the left. And as Jack has mentioned, um, this is actually all configurable. Uh, what we could do is um, start with just a few of those and you know, add additional ones as we decide to move forward. I'm going to quickly show how easy it is to do that. Um, assuming you have administrative uh, access, you could go to administration console and um, go to the configuration uh, screen. As you could see, there is a number of types of assets that uh, one could uh, govern. I'm going to disable some of them. Uh, lineage, is, lineage is actually quite interesting. And Jack, I think, will talk more about it. But I'm not going to do this in the context of this demo. So I've disabled it. Let me refresh my screen. And you will see that they've disappeared from the menu. Um, the other kind of things that you could see on this menu are some of the cross-cutting functionality. Um, so for example, we could search across. We could also see, you know, it, this is a collaborative environment. So you could manage tasks here, so you may be able to see all the tasks that are in the system and uh, assigned to you as a user, and you may need to handle them. Uh, for organizations that use JIRA, this could also be integrated with JIRA for your task management. Uh, with this, with, without uh, further ado, let's switch to um, the first um, um, part of the demo that will focus on data assets. And in each of those categories, like glossaries, data assets, technical assets, enterprise assets, um, there are also a specific entities or items that you manage within that. Uh, for you know, glossaries, those are terms. For data assets, um, there are things like databases, tables, columns, data sets, you know, logical data models, and so on. Um, it is important to mention that um, Edge allows you to modularize your concerns. So um, the overall domain of data in any company is uh, fairly large. And you could uh, modularize it by focusing on a particular data domain. Like here, for example, we have HR um, data versus product sales data. Um, this are all connectable. You could refer to them and include them into each other. But modularizing means that you could assign different stewards, different rights, different notifications, and, and, and so on. So let's, let us take a look at the product sales data and the kind of things we have here. Well, as you could see um, in, uh, in this display, there are a number of different types of things that are described in, in this particular um, data asset. And actually, we could see the kind of things that are managed um, right here. So there are databases. There are different data elements. There could be a, a logical data model, a physical data model, and, and, um, and so on. In the navigator, I hope you're seeing that um, the navigator that I'm selecting. So um, let us take a look at uh, databases. I've selected the database from the navigator. 
And I could see that I have three relational database here, databases here. One of them is e-commerce, and then there are two Northwind databases. Well, why two? This is because, um, of course, while the schema or physical data model may be shared of across, it's also important to um, actually know about instances of the databases. They could have um, different security requirements, for example, associated with them, and other different metadata. I mean, here we are focusing on the North Wind production. You know, we know that it is a production um, database because that tells us the environment type. We know that it's running on Oracle. We could even see a location link. Um, it is an implementation of this North Wind physical data model. And the physical data model, as you would expect, is about tables. Well, let's take a look at the orders table. Now that we've seen this physical data model, so I'm clicking on orders. And within that table, there are, of course, columns. So we could navigate to take a look at the ship country column, for example. This is one way of navigating through this environment. Uh, another way of navigating is uh, more visual, using something called neighborgram. So let me show it to you quickly. So we could see that um, this this is a column. It's a column of a particular table. We could get information about table uh, in in this way by expanding this diagram. Uh, we also see that it has a certain data type. And we see that what it is is the database column. So an interesting feature of this visualization is that you could also see the kind of relationships that a database column potentially could have. And um, here there is quite a number of different relationships and connections. Um, in fact, we're going to be paging through it because there is about 30 or 40 of them, so we have six pages. So, um, well, a column is a data element, so it could be superseded by another data element. It could have a compliance status, a compliance indicator, confidentiality level. It could um, uh, have data quality status. It could have criticality. It could be connected to the data requirement. So all of this are connect, you know, highlighting the type of connections um, that it could have, and the ones that um, you know Jack has has mentioned. Um, so um, let us create such a connection um, to um, something that's called permissible values. So I'm highlighting it here. And um, let me switch back to my editor screen and um, click on edit so we could start editing. So permissible values um, could be managed in different ways. Um, it could potentially be just a text field that describes something. It could be um, a connection to enumeration. In our environment, we're also managing reference data. And we have a reference data set of um, countries. So uh, what we will do is we will refer to that reference data set as a provider of permissible values. So specific, specifically, we're going to pick this alpha 2 code of countries from our reference data set, data set of country codes. So let me do that and save changes. And now we see a connection um, shown here, and we even see some sample values from that reference data set. If I wanted to go to the reference data set itself, since it's in this environment, I could do that by clicking on this arrow. And you know, here it opens up. And you know, we could look at countries and country codes and information of, um, of this nature. But um, 
Jack will, you know, provide the link to a separate demo that we have for reference data management. I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna focus on that. I will, um, I will go back to our um, product sales data where I was originally. Okay. Um, now, um, now that I've built this connection, let me build another connection to business glossaries. Uh, but before I do that, let me show you um, how we could search uh, within this environment. There's actually quite rich uh, search capabilities. There's a simple search um, um, that you know, allows you simply to type in like you would in Google, or you could also use faceted search visit. Um, for example, we could um, look at physical data types and see that our um, our data our uh, columns actually come from different types and so on. I will um, do a simple search. Uh, by just entering a string company. I remember that when I showed you tasks earlier, there was a task about connecting um, to the glossary term. Okay. I have here um, several columns that have company names in them. And uh, one of them actually has this task associated with them. There is a little icon, I hope you could see it on, on the lower right, that allows us to see any tasks or comments uh, associated with something. Also when, you know, tasks happens, there are notifications um, and, and so on, so they get emailed to the, um, to the participant. All right, so I see that I have a task that I need to connect this to the glossary term, presumably, presumably glossary term that explains what uh, a company name is. Uh, but in fact, I um, also have other columns like that that are about company names, so I think I want to connect them as well. And this lets me um, show you some of the more advanced uh, search features that we have. So let me um, do it using advanced search, do the same kind of search using advanced search. And this feature um, gives us many additional capabilities, including ability to batch edit search results. Um, so instead of connecting just one database column to the glossary term, I actually will do it for all of them. And let me go to this section where the traceability to glossary terms uh, is. And in this case, I um, know what, what I'm going to be connecting to, so I could just select it from autocomplete. If it's something more complex, actually faceted search is available to me to find the particular glossary term that I'm looking to. So that's another place where it comes in. So let me map it to the term company name. And I'm going to save changes now. Okay. And edit has happened. So And you see that this has been mapped to the term. I could also um, see the historical information here. By historical, I mean the audit trail of all the changes. So if we click on show history. We see that you know this has been added. And um, I could navigate to um, this particular um, to this particular term to see how it is now connected. So if I was looking uh, at this from the glossary term perspective, which I will do now, I could see where this glossary term uh, is uh, referred to. So actually, company name is right here, and 
like there is this convenient usages in other uh, vocabularies capabilities where I see uh, everything that was mapped to this term. Now I've um, connected um, the data element to the to the glossary term. I could have connected it to other things. For example, a report where this data element is being used or a requirement you know about this data element or um, something like uh, if you have a logical data model or even a conceptual data model using uh, what we call ontologies that connection could be established as well uh, let me show um, another um, aspect of connectivity by um, going to the data types. So it's another type or category of assets that uh, can be managed by Tabrate Edge. And um, you could see here Oracle data types, Avra data types, MySQL data types. Well, these are just examples. We actually ship with a large complement of data types. And when you go into, let's say, Oracle data types and um, select something like date, you could see where it's used across. So we could see that the date is used not just in the product sales data, but also in our HR um, data domain. So um, yet another example of connectivity between within the data assets and also between the different types of data assets. Jack has mentioned that this environment is configurable and um, I showed an extensible and I showed one type of um, configurability where um, I changed what we could see, uh, what, what assets we could govern. Another type is just um, changing what information we capture about each item. So here you see a data type and you know we capture particular information about it. Uh, previously, and let me um, let me return there um, um, to the glossary and um, see what kind of information we capture about uh, about the business term. So um, you see that there is definition, there is provenance metadata, there is um, possibly you know other sections. If I take it on edit, I see that there are identifier, business rules, there is information about status, and so on. All of this comes from the models that are shipped um, with this edge, and these models incorporating themselves best practices for data governance so we try to make sure to include um, all type of information and fields that you may want to um, you may want to use in describing this asset uh, however of course each organization is unique and you may want to um, to change this to remove the field to add the field and so on um, Edge is highly configurable, and in fact, you could use the environment itself to configure uh, what kind of information um, is presented because it's model-driven. And the models that we use um, to, um, to modify Edge are ontologies. Uh, so let me, ontologies are conceptual models of domain, and here you see some you know, domain-specific uh, ontologies such as you know healthcare or fiber, which comes from financial industry, but we could also add um, a configuration ontology to it, and I've already done done that, and it's a configuration for glossaries. So let me change what I could see in in a form for this glossary term. So I click here on edit. And the sections on, on the form are called property groups. So, um, um, so let me uh, navigate to different property groups. 
And you see that there are a number of property groups. Um, I'm, I want to see those that are specific to glossaries. And um, so let me look at the glossary term metadata. Um, that section of the form, if you remember, uh, and let us switch so we could see that, had four fields, label, definition, identifier, and business role. And uh, we see all of them defined here. So let me, uh, for this demo, just remove one of them. I'm going to remove a business roles one. Let's click on that. And I want to go back to the property constraint. So currently, this says that this field belongs to the section, and its data type is HTML. That gives us this nice rich, uh, rich text edit uh, widget. I'm going to make a change simply to screen it out. So I'm going to put none in the applies to field. Uh, by the way, those of you who follow semantic web standards probably have heard about Shuffle, RDF uh, data shapes um, language. And what we're doing here, you know, under the covers essentially are editing uh, a Shuffle constraint or RDF shape. So I'm going to save my change. And let me go back to. Um, where I was editing my glossary term. I'm going to cancel out of there and click on Edit again. And as you could see, the business rules field disappeared. So um, I've talked about uh, connectivity by showing you some connections. I've talked about um, some of the collaboration aspects with audit trails and um, and tasks, and I've showed you a little bit about um, configurability by um, configuring what types type of assets are um, can are governed, and also configuring what information we could capture about each. With this, I'm going to turn over to Jack because he has um, some additional features that I haven't uh, had the chance to go through. Um, to show you, and we also will take some questions. So, Jack, over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Irene. Okay. So, um, Irene did the demo for you. She reviewed some of these things, but just to reiterate, uh, she showed you top rated edges ability to represent a broad range of assets and how you can add or delete metadata fields or she didn't show you this, but you can also add or delete actual types of assets themselves. It's very, very flexible. She mentioned that. Uh, can also connect and map any type of asset to any other type of asset at any level. So you can go from very high levels down to very granular levels. Uh, the ability to support the collaboration you saw with some um, tasks and workflows and comments that could be passed back and forth, and this model-driven configurability, both for the user experience and the behavior of the software itself. So she mentioned, and I mentioned, that uh, Top Rate Edge supports an incremental approach to governance with a comprehensive suite of packages. Well, you see them here, and uh, might be a little difficult to catch on the screen, but you can see each of these provides support for a different range of assets. And each of these is available as an initial configuration of Edge, if you wanted to start somewhere. And any of these packages can be added in any combination toward your targeted scope of data governance. And uh, actually, it's time now for that poll that Christy mentioned when she introduced this. So um, uh, Christy, I'm going to uh, select a first poll and get started. Do you want to introduce us? Um, absolutely. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, as mentioned earlier in the presentation, we are going to ask just a couple of quick questions and we would love to have your feedback um, on these questions. The first polling question is, in what area did you start your data governance initiative? And if not started, where would you start? So the, the um, choices are business glossaries, reference data management, metadata management, Multiple areas are not sure. So if you could just take a second 
um, choose which is most appropriate, and we'll close the poll and share it with you. Um, okay, go ahead, Jack, if you want to publish that. Sure, Christy. We'll see what folks... There we go. Oh, interesting. Okay, so multiple areas is first, followed closely by metadata management with business glossaries last. Interesting. Okay, let's go to polling question number two, Jack. Okay. Okay, just one second. Okay, is it important to stay within the same software solution as you add on new areas for data governance? Is that very important, somewhat important, or not important? We can just take a second. We'll publish those results. And go ahead, Jack. We'll share those. Okay, it should come up here. Okay. So most people said somewhat important, which um, I don't think that's very surprising. Okay, and then the last question, we'll publish that, Jack, is how important is the ability to easily extend and customize your data governance solution? Same responses, very important, somewhat important, or not important. Let's take a second to do that. Um, looks like folks are answering quickly. Okay, Jack, go ahead and great. close that out. And okay, great. Not surprisingly, 76% of you think that that is very important. Um, thank you for doing that. And I'll just let Jack close out a couple of slides before we get to your questions. Okay, thanks very much, Christy. And uh, just want to check that we're back and you can see my slide again. Uh, Christy, Irene, anyone? Okay, great. So um, uh, Irene showed you some of Edge's ability to visually display and navigate the connections in your data. And uh, ac actually, she alluded to that I had a little more to show. This is just a quick example of how this capability can be used in a more focused way rather than just navigating around. The same technology allows you to track the lineage of data in this case, appearing on a key banking stress test form, the uh, Y9C. And uh, this form is very much like something that uh, you would see on your income tax if you're not one of the people who's familiar with it. It has many schedules, and each of these schedules has values on it that are uh, calculated based on many other factors. You know, you take what was on line three and divide it by what's on line five, and if the data, the answer that you get is greater than what was on line seven, enter the value here. It's that sort of thing. It's very complicated, and there are actually thousands of values that contribute to the calculation. So in this case, you can see how we use this visual lineage tracking to be able to trace the individual calculated values on the forms through the applications that do the calculations and produce them all the way back to the data source tables and columns that hold the values that were used in the calculations. And um, you can see there's a link on the bottom of this to a, a demo where we, we do this live. Uh, it's available on our website, and we'll be providing these slides following today's webinar, so you can visit the link here for a more detailed video demo. Um, Irene mentioned reference data management, and there's obviously too much within this uh, uh, extensive software package to cover, but we have uh, an entire ability to uh, manage and even more than manage, distribute reference data throughout the organization. Uh, the fact that it can be done within Edge also means that that reference data is connectable, for example, to your business glossaries and um, uh, you can trace it through and discover, for example, what systems are consuming this reference data in addition to managing it. And uh, something that's really significant in being able to do that uh, is we offer these visual dashboards. You can see just uh, down in the lower left of the image. And uh, before I switch again, I just want to point out we have a link to a demo of reference data management uh, on the website as well. So you may want to go there to get a better understanding of this. That dashboard down on the lower left, um, you can see that we provide a variety of dashboards um, that really give you a very good visual of whether you're meeting your goals or not organizationally. 
Um, this is not just available for reference data. It's available across everything that's managed within Edge. So you could use these for uh, business glossaries, for uh, lineage data assets, and see whether you're keeping up with your goals. So in particular, we have four sets of dashboards that we offer. Um, this one you're seeing here up in the uh, top shows uh, the completeness and validity of the data, and you get a good visual of um, what you're trying to complete. In this case, you can see it's 66%. Uh, We've got two data entries out of six that are required. Some of them lack required properties. Uh, and it shows their validity because, um, as I'll show you in a minute, we also uh, do constraint checking and can see whether the data meets the uh, constraints that have been established for it. So the sum total of all of these shows up in uh, a visual of where we are. Can also look at, uh, and I don't have it on the screen here, below there's a little bit of information about reference data sets, but beyond that we have operation pardon me, operational maturity screen that can show information about what software systems uh, are consuming a particular data set and the results of their compliance verification. And then we have an in-process um, dashboard that looks at a uh, workflow and gives you information about uh, what copies are in progress and what tasks have been completed and what haven't. Uh, mentioned data quality value validation. I'm not going to go into this in any detail, except to say that uh, there are some standard data quality constraints that you can use, or you can fully customize these and say, for example, you see here, uh, well, here's a property having more than one value. If it's a single valued property, you don't want it to have more value and you want to see that flagged organizationally across all of your data. And that's what our data quality metrics can do. Uh, and finally, and perhaps most significant, um, you could see from the survey you just took that it's only somewhat important that everything be in one piece of software in one application. Well, certainly that implies you're going to have multiple applications across your business and top rate products are designed very specifically to integrate with other business systems. Uh, in some competitive software, you'll find that this, uh, you actually have to buy a module for this, a connectivity module. This is baked into our product. Everything that you've seen us do today is available for uh, integration with other systems. And you can see that integration can take place between your data warehouses, search portals, other in-house applications, uh, quite directly through um, uh, RESTful API or through uh, JMS, and um, it can be done both in batch mode with imports and exports in a variety of different formats, and it can be done, as I mentioned, in real-time web services mode where you can uh, push or pull information from other applications into top-rate edge or vice versa. So uh, in summary, um, top-rate edge provides you with core flexibility and extensibility for user-defined models, assets, properties as needed. We have built-in models that can also be user-defined. We can make connections between any types of assets. And uh, finally, this flexibility to customize uh, both the user experience and the connection between your data and other external systems for a uh, complete data governance versus data governance that happens piecemeal in silos. It gives you complete referenceability. So with that, uh, we have a few minutes left for questions and uh, I guess uh, could hand it back to you to manage that, Christy. And uh, as we do that, I'm gonna just put those uh, summary benefits on the screen. Maybe it'll stimulate a few questions that you might have. Um, thank you, Jack. We have gotten quite a few questions that have come in. Um, we'll start with this one. Uh, okay, number one, when you say that EDG is extendable, what do you mean? Can you give some examples of the kinds of extensions that are possible and that customers are using? Irene, could you take that one? Um, yeah, sure, Christy. So I actually, as an example, let me um, 
let me answer it uh, in addition to answering uh, what I see a related question that says, can you assign different stewards to specific types of metadata like compliance stewards, technical stewards, etc. So that would be a good example of the extensions that um, you could do. Um, you know, in pre-built models, there is this um, connection between a particular type of asset to um, a steward or a group of stewards. Now, if you want to differentiate between different stewards and say, well, it's not that just that we have stewards, we have compliance stewards, we have business stewards, we have technical stewards, etc. You could extend the model to include this kind of information and then it becomes available and then you could assign them. So that's um, one example that a customer could make. Um, some uh, broader um, some broader extensions, well, there could even be a completely different uh, category of asset that one could manage in this environment. So um, recently we've been talking to an organization that, well, they, they want to manage their um, uh, metadata uh, on databases and so on. They also want to ma manage policies, which are defined as part of the um, governance um, assets, uh, but they um, also want to manage their physical assets, you know, they have equipment. Uh, so someone could create a new category of assets, such as an equipment, um, model it, and it becomes integral part of this environment, including its connectivity across. Um, of course, there is possible to do reports, there is possible to do different, you know, connections. There are all sorts of extensibility and configurability in terms of uh, user interfaces. The important thing um, that I should mention as far as extending the model um, is that um, we have designed support for extensions in such a way that it's forward compatible. So next time um, a new release is shipped and let's say uh, a model has moved forward, uh, you could upgrade freely and all your extensions will still be there. Thank you, Irene. Um, let's go to the next question. How does EDG integrate with other systems? Some products require you to acquire another product or module that provides connection capabilities. Does EDG require this? Irene, can you take that? Sure, Christy. Um, yes, there is no need to have a separate product, um, Tabrite Edge, and um, I think Jack has shown it in the integration uh, slide. So Tabrite Edge comes with pre-built in interfaces and connectivity uh, with other systems. Um, other systems could um, access Edge through web services um, to get information that is managed by it such as, you know, when we saw the dashboard, you know, one of the things on the dash dashboard is how do external systems comply with reference data? They do that through, you know, through accessing those apps. could pull this information. And, uh, but in terms of getting information from other systems to edge, there is also interfaces and capabilities. Obviously, this technical metadata that I showed, you know, definitions of tables and columns and so on, you wouldn't want to enter it manually. You would want to connect and get this information. And a number of uh, approaches are supported. You know, you could import a DDL, for example, or you could import the schema from the spreadsheet. It's also possible to connect directly to a database. Thank you, Irene. Um, there was another question here. Uh, the question is, do you have support for NEOM? Um, and I do know that we do transfer NEOM into ontologies. Um, and we will provide additional details on that as well as a lot of the other questions, all of the other questions that we received today, we actually have quite a few. Um, and we will provide answers to those after the webinar. So um, if you did submit a question, you will get an answer um, in detail following um, 
the webinar. So I think with that, um, we will close out today's webinar. We hope you found today's information valuable. As mentioned earlier, we will provide a link to this recorded presentation as well as the slides following today's webinar. Thank you, everyone, for your attention and interest in our product, and we hope you have a great day.